now we understand how to calculate the number of shares that are being sold in a seed deal or venture capital financing. You start with the investment amount. Obviously, that's essential. Price per share, not known right away, but we know how to calculate it. We know what our pre-money equity is. It's always the number of shares on the cap table right now before the investment shows up. What we negotiate is valuation. So obviously, valuation is essential. You're not selling shares if you can't agree on valuation. OK, well, what if you can't agree on valuation? What if you have a situation where you have your founding team, founder A, B, and C, and they're trying to raise money, and they meet this angel investor? We know they're an angel investor. You can see them on the street because they have wings and a halo. And they meet this angel investor, and they say, hey, um, this is our company, this is our product, this is our tech, this is our IP, here's the market we're tackling, here's the way we want to do it, we're trying to raise $500,000, we think it's worth your while. And 14 meetings and 14 pitches later, the investor says, I agree. I love you, I love the concept, I love the business, I love the upside, I love the opportunity, and I agree that $500,000 is the right number, let's do this. So then the party sit down, and they're looking to calculate the number of shares that they're going to be selling to this investor, and they're stuck because they can't agree on valuation and or they can't agree on that post-money ownership percentage. The angel investor wants to own 40% of the company. The founders only want to sell 10% of the company. The angel investor thinks that the company is only worth a million dollars. The founders think that the company is worth $5 million. What do you do? Well, you can't get a deal done. You're stuck. You have no valuation. And without the valuation, you can't calculate the price per share. Without the price per share, you can't calculate the number of shares you're selling. Without the number of shares you're selling, you can't have an accurate cap table, which means that when it comes time to sell the company and you're breaking things down into net proceeds, you're going to be engaging in criminal behavior with sharp objects and bloody faces as we try to figure out how we're going to sort it out. That doesn't work. So what do you do? Well, the answer is not just to say tough. Because getting to the point where you've made this match.com kind of connection is no small feat. And you don't want to squander that. You don't want to squander that opportunity. You don't want to squander that connection. But yet, you're trying to wrestle with a way to get a deal done. How do you do it? Well, there's a way to do it. And the way you do it is this. So we have our balance sheet. And our balance sheet is assets on the left, liabilities over equity on the right. And we know that ownership lives here. But there's another quadrant on the right-hand side of the balance sheet, liabilities, debt. OK, if we are not able to sell stock because we can't agree on valuation, we could take the investment as debt. In other words, we say to the angel investor, hey, instead of investing in the company and buying stock, why don't you make a loan to the company? And that was the answer that was hit upon 25 years ago when this was, re was really a problem, and it's held through to today. It's debt. Now, the original version of it was traditional debt. And with traditional debt, it's going to be evidenced by something called a promissory note, which is just a way of describing this kind of debt instrument. Sometimes people will call it a debenture or a bond if they want to sound fancy. You can shorten it to just a note. But promissory note is the formal term, and it just refers to an obligation to repay or an evidence of indebtedness, an IOU of sorts between the company and the lender, here our angel investor. And the wonderful thing about promissory notes is they are incredibly simple. And they basically have three attributes. There's the principal amount. That's the amount that's being loaned or invested here, $500,000. There's an interest rate. The IRS says in order for this to be debt, there has to be an interest rate. We don't believe the people loan money for free. 
Could be three or four percent, could be 30 percent. Typically what you're going to see is eight percent. Sometimes six, sometimes 10, but it's generally eight percent. Is that tied to Prime? Is that tied to LIBOR? Is that tied to what the Fed is up to? Is that tied to some kind of highly advanced MBA mathematical model? Absolutely not. Somebody plugged 8% into these instruments 25 years ago when they were being created and the concrete was still wet and it just stuck. It's the culture. One more term, I mentioned three. Maturity date. This is when it comes due. These notes, these promissory notes, are not structured like um, car loans or mortgages on a house where you're paying installments of principal and interest or maybe just interest for a while in different sorts of ways. You're making monthly payments. You're not making monthly payments on these notes. Instead, everything comes due at the end. So at the very end of the term, all the principal must be repaid and all the accrued interest. Sometimes it's called a balloon payment. So it's just pop, one payment. In these deals, the maturity date is typically 18 to 24 months. Could be 12 months, could be three years, but that's the kind of range you tend to be looking at. And that's it. Elegant, simple, easy, cheap, friction-free for the most part. Very attractive, very seductive, and it was. And it worked for about five minutes. And then it stopped working because everybody was angry. The founders were angry because they said, okay, you solved our first problem. We needed this $500,000 and we couldn't get it into the company because we couldn't agree on valuation. And you provided the solution, which was this note. So thank you. But there's a problem, and the problem is, is we've got to pay this back, principal plus interest, in 18 months or 24 months. And remember, everything that's been said in this episode so far, these aren't companies that are going to generate that kind of cash flow. That's not what these sorts of opportunities and ventures are about. We're not going to have this money in 18 to 24 months. So now I just have this dagger hanging over me. This sort of Damocles, what am I supposed to do? So they were terrified. Well, does that mean that the angel investors were thrilled because isn't that the way negotiations usually work? You know, one side's happy, the other side's sad. Well, this is one where the other side was sad too. The angel investors weren't terrified, they were irritated. And the reason they were irritated was they said, look, this is a super early stage company. Remember, this is closer to the startup side of the spectrum than it is the venture capital side of the spectrum. This is very early, highly speculative. And the angel investors said, I invested half a million dollars, cold hard cash, for the opportunity to get back 8% 8, 8 interest. And by the way, there's a really pro high probability that I'm not going to get repaid. So good chance I'm going to lose all my money. The best case scenario is I get my money back plus 8% per year. And yeah, 8% is nice, but in this kind of asset class, that's not much of an outcome. And by the way, I didn't do it for this. I didn't do it for principal plus interest. I did it because I wanted to be on the cap table. I wanted an ownership interest. I thought this was going to be a unicorn. I wanted to own a third of a company that was going to sell for a billion dollars. I didn't do it under these sorts of economic terms. So they weren't happy. So the founders were terrified. The investors were irritated. So obviously this solution was not going to hold. So back to the proverbial whiteboard. So what do we do? We were at loggerheads around valuation. We tried to do a traditional promissory note but that didn't get it done. But people thought about it and they thought about it and they said, well, it's not so much that the promissory note is a bad idea. It's that the founders don't want to have to repay it in cash. And they were comfortable selling shares of stock. That's where this started. And the investor definitely wants to be in shares of stock. So we have to figure out a way to get the note, get the note from being debt to being equity. We need to create a mechanic by which it could convert from being a liability to being shares of stock. And that's why, you know, let's call it version 2.0 that emerged was the convertible note, the convertible promissory note, the convertible debenture, the convertible bond, all the same thing, all synonyms. 
the idea is, is we have principal, we have interest, we have a maturity date, but now there's an extra component, which says at some point between the date of issuance of, of the note, the date of the investment, and the maturity date, we want to convert the note into equity. Well, what's that trigger? What triggers the conversion of the note into equity? Well, what we're going to need to, to effectuate that conversion is evaluation, which stymied us in the first place. Well, when might there be evaluation? A venture capital financing, or the next real stock financing where the parties can agree on valuation. In notes, this is laid out as a defined term called qualified financing. Now notice I said defined term. When you pick up a note, you're gonna see this phrase qualified financing included in it. And it'll be a capital Q and a capital F. Anytime you pick up a legal document and it has capital letters, you know that that means it's defined someplace. And the qualified financing will be defined somewhere in that note. And that definition is very important because it tells us what the trigger is to convert the note from debt to equity. So how might it be described? Well, almost always, the qualified financing will say it involves a share, the sale of preferred stock, because what we're trying to get is a valuation. But the question is, in what context? Well, the context is raising a meaningful amount of money, okay? What, what the investors don't want to have happen is they don't want the founders to sell them this note and then the next week go to their grandfather and say, hey, if you invest $10 in our company at a billion dollar valuation, that's gonna force the conversion of this note at a billion dollar valuation. That doesn't work for the investor. The investor wants some assurance that this is a legitimate, credible, market-based transaction. And there are different ways that that can be articulated. They can speak to the types of investors that must be involved, um, the specific attributes of the preferred stock that's being sold, but 99 times out of 100, putting everything else aside, what's focused on is the amount of money. And a qualified financing might say, sale of preferred stock of at least $500,000, or a million dollars, or $2 million. But it's a brute force way of trying to say, look, if you're selling preferred stock at that level, chances are it's a credible transaction, and it's generating a valuation that everybody feels comfortable using, not only within the context of that new money, but also in the context of converting the note. Well, how does that work? How would this sort of show up? Well, let's sort of take it through a quick example. What would happen is our qualified financing takes place. And our qualified financing says that there's a pre-money valuation of $10 million. Okay? And we know in our example that we have 10 million shares existing already. Founder A plus founder B plus founder C. So $10 million, pre-money valuation, divided by 10 million shares, we have a price per share of a dollar. Let's say that our qualified financing involves, let's just say it's a $5 million Series A financing. It's our venture capital financing. It's the end of our seed deals era. So that gets plugged in here, $5 million. $1 gets plugged in here. $5 million, our investment amount, divided by the $1 price per share. That means the investor, the venture capital investor or whomever in our qualified financing invested $5 million at a dollar a share and is receiving 5 million shares. Great. What's going on with our note? Well, our note is leveraging the terms of this transaction. So we have the 10 million divided by 10 million, which is a $1 price per share. That's what's being used for the note, a $1 price per share. What's the investment amount? The investment amount is principal plus interest. Sometimes it's just principal. Sometimes we're, we're just converting principal and they're gonna pay the interest back in cash, but that's usually not what happens. Usually it's principal plus interest. And let's just say at this point in time that $15,000 of interest has accrued on the note. So we have $500,000 in principal. We have $15,000 in interest. That means we have 
$515,000 as our investment amount. $515,000 divided by $1 is 515,000 preferred shares. Our venture capital investor in the qualified financing invested $5 million for 5 million shares. Our note holder converted their note, $515,000 in principal plus interest at a dollar share for 515,000 shares. Our note has moved from the liability portion of the balance sheet to the equity portion of the balance sheet, and everybody's happy. The sword of Damocles is gone. There's no obligation to repay because now it's moved from debt to equity. The investor has what they want. They're on the cap table. They have a, the opportunity to have their pro rata share of what they hope will be uni unicorn-like net proceeds. And our venture capitalist, of course, is chugging along doing their thing. So this works, and it worked well when it was introduced. And it worked for longer than five minutes, worked for a couple years, but then a certain level of dissatisfaction emerged. And the dissatisfaction was felt by the angel investor. Because the angel investor sensed that they weren't getting the kind of benefit on their investment that they should. And they thought about it this way. I'm not sure anybody literally charted it this way, but in their mind, intuitively, what they're sensing was this. You have these axes, and this is time, and this is value, and in theory, our company is moving like this. As time goes on, the value goes up. And our qualified financing with our venture investor or whomever took place here, when the value or valuation was at that point. The angel investment took place here. Now with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, you can see plotting it backwards that the value was there. And as we know from that equation, the lower the value, the more shares they're gonna get. So there's a motivation on the part of the angel investor to want a lower valuation. And they're looking at this, they're looking at these axes and they're saying to themselves, wait a minute, we're converting at this valuation. When we invested at what we now know was that valuation, we left stock on the table. We gave up some potential upside. We came out of this overall aggregate transaction owning 5% of the company when we could have owned 10% of the company or whatever. So they, they felt to themselves, this doesn't really work for us. We need a different approach. Now remember, we got into this, we started to head down this path because we couldn't align on valuation. So how do we fix this? If we know that the angel investor probably ought to get a little bit more juice and a little bit more consideration for what they've done, but we don't actually know what that valuation is. And this is why in version 3.0 of the note, something was introduced called the discount. Now a discount can be 5%, a discount can be 50%, a discount is usually 20%. Again, was that driven by some heavy quant? No. Someone dropped 20% when the concrete was wet and it's stuck. It's the culture. So the discount is 20%. What are we saying? Well, it's a discount off of what the VC pays. So if the price per share is a dollar for the venture capital investor for that $5 million, for the $515,000 represented by the note, they're gonna convert instead at a price per share of 80 cents. In other words, the venture price, $1, multiplied by 0.2. I'm sorry, multiplied by 0.8, or 20% coming off of it. A 20% discount is applied. So $515,000, $515,000 divided by 80 cents is going to give you more than 515,000 shares, okay? The lower the price, the more shares you get. So by applying a discount 
to the VC's price, the angel investor is going to get a few more shares than they otherwise would have gotten. That represents a lower valuation. That represents a nod toward this schematic, a sense that, yes, angel investor, you did come in earlier than the venture money. And as a consequence, you should be accommodated. And you should get some extra juice for that. And we're going to use the brute force of the discount. We're not going to calculate a hard and fast valuation number. But we're going to use a brute force discount to provide you with that kind of extra benefit, to provide you with that extra consideration, um, to show that we appreciate the circumstances and situation that you're in. And that worked. And it worked for a long time. Then around 20, let's call it 2010, 2011, dissatisfaction re-entered the mix. Why? Well, there's a reason for that era and for arising in that era. Before 2010, 2011, you know, we were suffering from the Great Recession. And during the Great Recession, valuations and company growth was looking more like this. When that's happening, the angel investors aren't so concerned about whether or not they're getting proper consideration for the early stage nature of their investment. They're just hoping these companies stay alive and they're not seeing that much of a delta between when they invested and when the venture money showed up. The discount is plenty. But as the economy recovers, and the startup economy in particular recovers, what starts to happen? Valuations start to recover. And they start doing this. Okay? Well, when that happens, these deltas are more pronounced than they would otherwise be. And yeah, the discount is nice, but it's not sufficient. And the angels know it. And the angels are feeling mistreated, disrespected. At the very least, they feel like they're leaving money on the table, they're leaving shares on the table, and they need to structure this in a different kind of way. Something else has happened. You know, these notes started to come into vogue in the mid-90s. And that's not an accident. The mid-90s represented the start of the dot-com era. And that was a time when valuations were hard to come upon because it was brand new. And nobody knew what these companies were and how they operated and software was changing. And the way that we consume services and products was changing. E-commerce was new. It had an impact across the board, um, even touching the life sciences in some, in some interesting and adjacent ways. And so we really were in a period during that time where valuation was hard to discern and hard to understand. By 2010, 2011, we'd had 15 years of experience. And as a consequence, we had precedence. We had points of data that we could look to and say, you know what, at this stage, under these circumstances, a company that looks and feels like this probably is worth two to three million dollars or five to six million dollars, or 10 to 11 million dollars. You weren't having the same massive gulfs between aspirational valuation from the founders and the aspirational valuation of the investors because there was just more information. So as a consequence, the investors said, well, we're gonna use that to our benefit. What we're gonna say is, we know we're investing at this period of time. And we see that there's a likelihood that the valuation could run up to that level in connection with the qualified financing. We're gonna put a hard ceiling here. In other words, we're gonna put a cap in place, which is gonna say under no circumstances will we convert at a valuation higher than that level. So now our notes have elaborated a little bit. We have a principal amount of $500,000, we have an interest rate of 8%. We have a maturity date of 18 to 24 months. But in version 3.0, we added this discount of 20%. And now in version 4.0, we're adding the notion of a cap. And the way this will read is, the note will convert at the lesser of, because remember, they want a low price, lesser of a discount 
off the preferred price paid by the new money, the venture investor in the qualified financing, or a price per share calculated on the basis of the cap. And the cap is expressed as a valuation number. Could be a million dollars, could be two million dollars, could be $10 million, could be $12 million. And you run the math. Every time a qualified financing takes place and the venture investor or whomever shows up and we work the math, we would calculate for the note holder, how do they do better? Do you take a 20% discount off the venture investor's price per share? Or do we run a different level of calculation and instead of the VC's valuation, we insert the cap. This is where the cap goes. So if the cap is a million dollars, one million dollars divided by 10 million shares is 10 cents. That's your price per share using the cap. With a 20% discount, if the venture capital price is a dollar, 20% off of that is 80 cents. Obviously a dime is better than 80 cents. That's what your angel investor is going to take advantage of. That's the state of play with respect to notes. And this holds, and it's still true today. This is the typical structure of a convertible promissory note. Principal, interest rate, maturity date, discount, cap. Now, in listening and in thinking about this, you may be saying to yourself, version 4.0 of the note includes a cap. The cap is quite literally inserted into the valuation field of that equation. The cap is some kind of proxy, some kind of representative for valuation. The whole reason we started down this path of convertible notes was because we couldn't agree on valuation. We wanted to sell preferred shares. The investors wanted to buy preferred shares. The founders wanted to sell preferred shares. That's where we started, but we couldn't sell preferred shares because we couldn't agree on valuation. That's why we ended up in this sort of tentative position with this, with this note, which became a convertible note, that would convert into shares later, once valuation was more discernible. Well now, right from the jump, we're saying, we're gonna have a conversation about calculation, and we're gonna, or about valuation, and we're gonna put it, we're gonna boil it down to a number that we're gonna include in the note. So you may be saying, why use a convertible promissory note? If the angel investor and the founders are negotiating about a cap, why don't they just change their language, negotiate valuation, sell preferred shares and be done with it? And you know what? A lot of angel investors agree. And once the cap was introduced and became the norm in the world of convertible promissory notes, you saw them used with less frequency. Many angel investors agreed with this analysis of saying, let's just pivot back to preferred shares. Let's just knock it out and take care of it now. But there's still a substantial cohort of angel investors who use convertible promissory notes. And the question would be why? And the answer would be this. It's not because they can't agree on valuation, which was the original rationale. The answer is a new rationale. And the new rationale is comfort. They, were, they used convertible promissory notes for 15 years and they got used to it. They developed forms. They became very simple to negotiate, simple to implement. They could scale using them as investors. They turned over click, click, click very easily, very quickly. It was a nice way to get a deal done. It was their style. It was their culture. It was the approach they took and they just decided to stick with it. That's the new rationale. They'll use a cap. Very few notes in the seed stage are uncapped, coming without caps. They have a cap, but they use the note because it's easy. And it's a little bit easier to use a note than it is to negotiate preferred stock. 